So if we start two weeks current workshops, not the topological dynamics, this is the part of the time of semester, and time of semester in banner centers, brain. The first speaker is Phil Boylan from Florida. This will be the first talk on the unit course and topology for the Thank you. So The uh, slides are all posted here, and so the slides are the slides are approximately twice as long as what I'm going to tell you. In particular, all the proofs are in the slides. I prove most things, but I'll have to skip most of them to get through the material. And I wanted to start by thanking the Simons Foundation and uh, Institute for allowing me to be here and present these talks. So here's something from mechanics, not uh, actually it's inspired by mathematics. So here are two stirring protocols. This is a viscous fluid. This is a numerical simulation. But you notice the difference between the two stirring protocols is here we rotate counterclockwise, here we rotate clockwise, and here we just rotate clockwise. So it's fairly clear they're very, very different, even though energetically or mechanically, they seem to be quite the same. In terms of what they do to the fluid is quite different. In particular, there's this invariant structure that keeps coming back. And here there's basically no mixing. So the interest of this physically is, is the mixing here. And so let me just show you some actual experiments. Uh, so this is actual dye and glycerin. And this is really just a warm up for the lectures. So the difference between these two protocols is strictly topological. And if you think about doing the switching of the rods in time going upwards, you get this guy and this guy, and you notice these are topologically different. You can't deform this one into that one. And that's expressing the fundamental topological difference between these two. So this is just, this slide is more for people, for engineers. Um, but here's the question that lies behind all of the talks, is how much information about the dynamics can be deduced from a homotopy class or an isotopy class? So in this fluid motion, I've ignored completely the equations, and all I'm understanding is the isotopy class relative to the stirs. So the question is, can I pull out dynamical information from that or not? Well, there are two cases, and sometimes you can do a lot. So in the pseudo nosov stirring protocol, I can tell you that the fluid motion has certain periodic orbits, give a lower bound for its topological entropy, tell you about ergodic invariant measures, et cetera. And in the other case, I can't tell you anything, but there's a fixed point, all right? So this is the theme, is how do we tell the difference between the two, and how do we extract information from the homotopy class or the isotopy class and reach dynamical conclusions. All right, so here's what I'll be telling you. Um, so first I'll tell you the basic persistence theorems. We start with the index of the Lefschetz theorem, then the Nielsen theory, which tells you about periodic points and global shadowings, which tells you about all things. This guy, I'm actually not gonna tell you about very much. And then I'll tell you about computations and applications. And there's lectures this week. This week, I'll mainly be talking about homotopy and the fundamental group and the universal cover. And next week, it's mainly homology using the universal abelian cover um, and a theorem of Franks next week, which is, okay. So now I'm going to switch and then I have to reshare, I'm told here. So can I work this? Out? Should you come do it? Stop sharing. I'll stop share and then reshare. Just share the PDF. Okay. So here's. Oops. We need to be full screen properly here. So we have one.
Uh, okay, there we are. All right, so here's the first example. So here's an example that just uses calculus, which shows you the kind of theorem we're talking about. So we start in these theorems usually with a model system with some kind of hyperbolicity, well-known dynamics. So in this case, we start in the circle with angle doubling. We all in our first dynamics course, we prove these various properties, dense periodic points, um, dense transitive points, um, entropy is log two. There's a Markov partition that allows us to model it. And the question is, if I homotope the map, how much of this stuff persists? Okay, so, all right, I'm just gonna have to work around this. So let's start with another degree two circle map. So if you're homotopic to angle doubling, you're a degree two circle map. And we lift everything to the universal cover. So as I already mentioned, that's a big theme in this work is working in a covering space where you unwrap the dynamics. And the essential feature is some kind of hyperbolicity and a cover of the lift. All right, so we lift the universal cover. Our angle doubling looks like this. Our homotopic map looks like angle doubling plus a bounded bit, all right? So that's easy to see where this thing is periodic, continuous, and therefore bounded. All right, so let's iterate this guy in the cover as we usually do, and we do a little induction and get this formula. So you notice that we're running off to infinity, most points at an exponential speed of two to the n with some error here, okay? So I have a note here to mention, I keep saying cover, so in topology a cover is open sets and all, but cover here is shorthand for covering space. So everything's going off to infinity at rate two to the n. All right, so like we would do a rotation vector, we normalize, but now we have an exponential rate that we're normalizing. So we divide by two to the n, take a limit, notice it's this sum, this guy's bounded, notice this guy is exponential downstairs, bigger than one, so this guy converges. All right, Weierstrass M test, is basically calculus. All right, so we call the convergent series here alpha tilde, and then you notice little computation that two times alpha tilde, we just do an index shift, is alpha tilde compared, composed with G tilde. All right, so again, just follows from this, this part of the formula once we know it converges. All right, so putting it in a commutative diagram, we get this. Everything is equivariant with respect to deck. We push it downstairs and we get this. All right, now alpha is degree one, so it's on two. So we get a semi-conjugacy from anything homotopic to angle doubling to angle doubling. All right, so that's what I say here. The state, this is a theorem, which we just proved. If we're homotopic to angle doubling, then we're semi-conjugate to it. It's a factor. I'm oh, sorry, it's an extension of it. All right, so another, if we want to be algebraic here, if the action on first homology or fundamental group is multiplying by two, then the dynamics is least as complicated as angle doubling, which has all those properties, okay? So this is a baby case of a theorem of Frank's, which I'll spend a lot of time on next week. Um, there's other ways to prove it closer to the way Frank's did it. If we look at a Bonnock space of all lifts of continuous degree ones of map, you define an operator, by composition divided by two, it's clearly a contraction. It has a fixed point, and that fixed point is the semi-conjugacy. If you do it this way, you can get a little more regularity by building the proper Bonnock space, but it's not an issue for us right now. All right, so I said, notice the structure of these theorems. You have a model map. You understand its dynamics, especially it's expanding in the cover, and you perturb it, if staying in the same homotopy class or isotopy class later, then the dynamics don't go away. You can create new stuff, but the dynamics don't go away. All right, now when I was, oops, when I studied physics, the professor was very strong on something called the conservation of difficulty, which meant if life went easy in one category, then you had to pay the price somewhere else because you know the physical world was what it is. Right, so the price you pay here is low regularity of the semi-conjugacies. If you look at this formula, if you remember no differentiable functions, the way Weierstrass constructed them, this guy looks like the construction of the Weierstrass no differentiable function. 
And in fact, that is the case here. So the regularity of alpha, there's some various theorems I proved around it, which aren't important to the theme here. But here are some pictures. You have to be careful with these are all degree one, but they have different scales. So these are different pictures for different Gs of what alpha looks like. So you see there's, well, these, this is because there's a flat spot. So and you can prove theorems about these. They're nowhere, you know, they're holder of some exponent, but no more. They're nowhere locally differentiable, nowhere locally one-to-one, -one, et cetera, so as I said. Yeah, so this is, a, this is the picture of a degree one map of the circle. So it's just everything is mod one in the circle. So it goes from, so here it's 0.42 and here it's 1.42. Right, so they're all just pictures of the map of the circle. But the thing that's tricky can be confusing. If this doesn't look like degree one, that's because the spikes are so big, the scale got expanded. It still goes from zero to one. Okay. So these are the semi conjugacies, right? So they're pretty wild. So you can prove stuff like the generic pre image is a Cantor set. All right. So here's the semi conjugacies, and the same thing is true in higher dimensions with Frank's theorem, but you can't kind of draw the pictures. All right, so I have a bunch of theorems about this, which I'm gonna skip, because it's not particularly germane to the um, thing. Okay, so that was all to sell you on the possibility that we could do a large scale perturbation in the homotopy class and preserve the dynamics, all right? In that case, it was particularly simple to deal with, but, there's much more complicated situations. And sometimes you just have periodic points persisting. Sometimes you have minimal sets persisting. So there's a whole kind of hierarchy of structure here. Okay, so this all starts, as you probably remember from your topology courses with the index. And so sitting in the background, so I put in my abstract that everything is depending on hyperbolicity at some level. So the invariance of the, of the index under homotopy is really fundamentally based on this old theorem of Hopf that maps of the circle of the sphere have the same degree. That means how they act on homology and degree and homology here. They have the same degree if and all if they're homotopic. All right, so this is sitting somewhere at the foundation of the invariance of the index and the Lefschetz theorem. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, but I think you've all kind of seen it before, but it really is the foundation, the local foundation, and you build it periodic points, uh, recurrent points, global, et cetera. Okay. All right, so here's the definition. So here's the definition, which you all probably know. You have an isolated fixed point and with the function f, you look at the difference here by convention, it's the opposite of the displacement for topological reasons. And the, this is a map from a sphere to a sphere. You take a sphere around your fixed point. And as I was saying, it's sitting at the heart is the degree. So the index is the degree of this induced map. And here are some examples. So these are a little hard to work out by hand. Uh, this is probably the easiest one because you just place. So it's no, actually, this is the easiest one. No, actually, this is the identity. This is rotation. This one is if you try to do this by hand, well, you eventually work it out. The index is minus one. Flip saddle, you can do it from pictures. You're a better man than I. Um, and the saddle node, this is an example with index zero. Again, you can work it out, it gives you a degree zero map of the circle in dimension one, you have index, let's see, attractors have index one, repellers have index minus one, and saddle note has index uh, zero. And here's what you usually use if you can. So this is a not too difficult calculus exercise, but if you have a smooth fixed point, and this is non-singular, which is to say one is not an eigenvalue of the derivative, then the index is the sign of this determinant of the identity minus the derivative at the point. All right, so for example, the, the flip saddle, let's say locally it's in one direction, it's minus two, that's the expanding and minus one half, but it's flipped, this has index one. 
All right, this, as we'll see in a second, unless you can think the pictures, has index minus three. So in particular, if you see this in a smooth system, then you have derivative, you have an eigenvalue of one at the fixed point. So you kind of have to slow things down near the fixed point and it'd be very be non-hyperbolic to get such a picture. All right, so this is, I'm gonna skip this slide. This is just for the sake of honesty. So if you have, don't have an isolated fixed point, what do you do? So Dold figured all this out. You use relative homology, you use homology of pairs, and it all kind of, you kind of do what you think you would do with the homology of pairs, and then it kind of works out. So let me not focus on this. It's, it's anyway, it's fairly standard algebraic topology, but it's not terribly relevant. Well, it's relevant that it exists, but we don't need to get into its details. So the index has lots of nice properties. And let me just emphasize on, so Dole made a list of them which characterize the index. The most important ones for us is the index is not zero, there's a fixed point. The second is if you fix the circle and homotope the map without changing, without moving the fixed point set outside, then you don't change the index. So this is sitting at the heart of all these homotopy stability arguments that I'm gonna give you. And it's additive. If you have a bunch of separated, if your fixed point set splits into pieces, then you can split the sum. All right, so these are just basic properties. And here's just some examples to illustrate that. Here, the index was zero. And we can leave the circle alone and do a bifurcation, a saddle node bifurcation, and create a sink and a saddle. And our index is still zero. All right, and this guy, this is show you why the index is minus three, is you use homotopy invariance as you push out, like doing a DA, you push out and you pick up four saddles, and then you have a uh, repeller in the middle, and you see the total index is minus three. All right, so this is a good old fixed point index. And for periodic points, you do the obvious thing, you take the nth iterate. All right, and a little comment here, as you probably all know, that we'll usually be considering at this point the fixed point set. And so it can, it's not, if you're in the fixed point pot, we're not saying that's your least period. It means that your period divides it. Okay, so that's just a little caution. Okay, so that was quick remembrance of the good old Lefschetz formula, sorry, the good old index. And now let's look at the Lefschetz theorem. So the Lefschetz theorem again is classically, I think it's around 100 years old if I remember my dates. And it and Nielsen theory arose actually around the same time. And here is just what class of spaces we're gonna work in. Um, so these are at Euclidean neighborhood retracts. This is just to make the theory work. We're almost always going to have manifolds or graphs or CW complexes, but we really need the, the space is compact, right? So if you don't have compactness, then nothing works. Okay, so the left hits number, you create from the action on homology with an alternating sum. And uh, this is a finite sum because at some point, the, um, all the homology vanishes. So you take the alternate sum of the traces, you get the Lefschetz number. And special case is the Euler characteristic is the Lefschetz number of the identity. Here, this rank is just Betty, Betty numbers. All right, so that's the Euler characteristic in terms of the Lefschetz number. So the Lefschetz Euler formula is what we want as beginnings of the theory is that the index of all the fixed points of F is the Lefschetz number, all right? So assuming we're, you know, we're in a nice space here, all right? So we add up all the indices and we get the Lefschetz number. Okay, so the way this is usually proved, so usually in a topology course, you usually do it in the PL category with a finite number of isolated points, and then you just separate the sum into various indices. Okay, so first application is if you're homotopic to the identity and you are 
other characteristic is not zero, then you have a fixed point. All right, so notice the important thing about this, which I should have emphasized here. Sorry, let me go backwards here properly. Is that this just depends on the action on homology, right? So it just depends on the homotopy class, right? So this is dynamical data. It's not real interesting at this point, but it's dynamical data based on the just the action on homology, all right? And so it's standard examples. This has Euler characteristic one. So there's a fixed point if you're homotopic with identity. If you have a sphere and it's even, right? Odd dimensional spheres have zero Euler characteristic. If it's even dimensional, then you have a fixed point and the total index of the fixed point set is two. All right, so here's a caution for what we're going to go into, which maybe I'm sure you're aware of, but the Lefschetz formula just tells you the total index, right? So it tells you, you could have a sink and a source, or you could have a single index too, all right? So if you take Z goes to Z plus one on the plane and compactify it into the sphere, you get a fixed point there. All right, so you know the total index is two, but you don't know if it's this or this or something else, all right? And the higher genus surfaces, just as another example, have non-zero other characteristic. So if you're homotopic, the identity of fixed points. Okay, so here are some more examples, a little more sophisticated examples where you're not homotopic to the identity. So these are examples I'll be using throughout. And first is on the circle, which we've already seen. So let's say we're degree N. Well, then there's only H0 and H1, and you act as the identity, and the action on H1 is multiplication by N. So the Lefschetz number is one minus N. All right, so in dimension one, we saw there's only index plus one minus one or zero. So anything, any degree one has at least N minus one fixed points, All right? So we actually had a stronger example, but this is just for an example. All right, let's look at a linear NOSOF. So here we act on the plane, two-dimensional linear NOSOF. Then the action, so there's zero homology, second homology are both act by the identity. And the minus sign here is the action on H1. The action on H1 is just given by the matrix that tells you how circles are moved on it. And so we get index minus five. All right, so once again, what do we get to conclude? We get to conclude that anything homotopic to this linear NOSOF has a fixed, has a fixed point set with total index minus five, but it stops there. So in fact, we'll see from Nielsen theory that in fact, it has at least five fixed points. All right, so Nielsen theory will separate out the fixed points into classes and allow us to conclude that they all persist. All right, so just a little comment here is the compactness is essential, as is fairly obvious. You know, this, the plane has non-zero other characteristic and it's easy to construct a fixed point free map by just translating. Okay, so I just, for these lectures, I came up with three maps. So a lot of this I'm going to tell you in all the lectures is kind of inspired by surface theory, but to understand it, you need a fair amount of machinery buildup. So I came up with some examples in lower dimension, which will illustrate all the basic points with proofs that you can actually get your handles on, hands on with just elementary means. All right, so all these maps are going to be on the wedge of two circles. I'm drawing it like this for reasons that will be clear. Um, so the fundamental group is the free group on two symbols. First homology is just Z squared. All right, and I'm going to make a homeomorphism first. Sorry, this first we're going to talk about the algebra first and use the algebra to generate the map. And the map is going to be kind of the tight map, the simplest map, which realizes the algebra. All right, so here is a map on the free group. So you, you just have to say where the generators go. And we realize this on the wedge of two circles in the simplest way you can imagine. 
right? You, you, you do what the action on the free group does, and then you make it as tight as possible. So if you think about what that means is everywhere the derivative is four, because this has length four, all right? And you fix, you fix this intersection, all right? So we're gonna see a bunch of examples in every case, you act on pi one and make it as tight as possible. Okay, so what do we know about this guy? All right, so this is custom made for our dynamics, right? You have, you can divide the circles into four pieces and they all, each one wraps around everything. So you get a Markov partition and a way I'm gonna draw these is with the arrow shift. So because of the formula here, A goes to AAAB. That means that if you think of subdividing circle A into four pieces, we go, A goes to itself three times. That's going all the way around here and it goes to B once. All right, so I'm gonna draw this as an arrow shift as opposed to a vertex shift. And here's the transition matrix. So A goes to itself three, way, three times. We go to B, B goes, oops, one of these arrows should go the other way. B goes to itself. And so if you're not familiar with arrow shifts, rather than the paths, is you look at the collection of all infinite paths as opposed to infinite symbols given by vertices. All right, there are the equivalent formulations. You could subdivide, see if this, if you did this as a vertex shift, it'd be eight by eight matrix. So it's much easier to think about it like this. All right, so this tells us from standard dynamics that the number of fixed points of the kth iterate is the transition matrix minus one. Now, where's the minus one coming from? It's coming from the overlap, right? So there's the Markov partitions overlap at the vertex, and that's multiply counted. All right, now, what do we get on first homology? Sorry, this is not visible. I don't, probably can't disappear that. So the action on homology is we abelianize. So A goes to 3A plus B, B goes to 3B. So our action on homology is given by the same matrix. It's like a, a Nossoff, but here it's on, it's on H1. There shouldn't be a K here. So the Lefschetz formula is one minus this. All right, now all the fixed points of index minus one. So here's a case where the Lefschetz theorem sees everything. This is wonderful. For all iterates, at least the Lefschetz theorem sees all the proper indices at all, at all, all levels of scale. All right, now I keep coming back to this point because it's kind of the punchline of Nielsen theory is that at this point, if you're homotopic to the you know, to the map, you only have an index argument, you only have an index of the case iterate. You don't have number of fixed points, all right? But in fact, Nielsen theory will give us that. All right, so here's another example. So here, uh, the action on pi one or on the free group is generated by this. All right, so now A goes to two copies of itself, B, and two copies of B. So we get an arrow shift with a diagram like that. And the number of fixed points is uh, the, the trace of the k theta to this just from standard symbolic dynamics minus one. But the bad news for the Lefschetz formula is that the action on homology is dead zero. All right, so the action on homology is dead zero. All we get from the Lefschetz formula is that the Lefschetz number of every iterate is one. So virtually no information about fixed points. But as we'll see, Nielsen theory will give us what we want. The Nielsen theory will tell us the number of fixed points, that all the fixed points persist, that you have at least the number of fixed points as this map. All right, one more example just of what goes bad. Here's almost the same map, but now you go to three copies of itself. So here's the matrix. Here's the number of fixed points, standard way. Now the Lefschetz number is the left, it's, sorry, the action on homology is the identity. So that's how I cook this up. <laughs> the action is the identity. And so the left, number is dead zero. All right, the left, number is dead zero. And so no information at all. But once again, Nielsen theory will come in 
and save the day and give us not only the index of the kth iterate, but a bound on the number of periodic points. So if you're isotopic, again, go back to the original claim, I should say homotopic to this, you'll have, you'll have at least its dynamics. All right, so that's all to be proven. All right, so here's just a comment that is in, points to an interesting phenomenon that I won't be telling you about. Um, you might ask, having shown all these things, natural question is if the Lefschetz numbers get arbitrarily large, you have infinitely many periodic points. You know, be a reasonable um, conjecture, gets bigger and bigger, you have more and more index. But your conjecture would be true if it was C1, this old result of Shub and Sullivan. So it's not true when it's C0. So there's an easy example, which I'll tell you. So it's a curious phenomenon to me anyway, that something that looks strictly topological is true with C1, but not C0. And this is also true of the entropy conjecture, which I'm also not going to be telling you about. And for that, there's a similar counterexample. All right, so here's the counterexample. It's fairly simple. So you take the sphere and you take, I guess, the meridians and you do Z goes to Z squared on all the meridians. All right. So you're not doing Z goes to Z squared globally on the Riemann sphere. You're doing Z goes to Z squared on the individual circles. In particular, it's not differentiable at the north and south poles. And you compose that with a north or south pole. South pole flow. All right, so having done that, you see that what you got, well, you got an H0, you got an H1, sorry, H2. This You're taking the sphere and wrapping it twice around itself, so you have an H2, and the, 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 the iterate of the H2 is 2 to the n, because you're wrapping 2 to the n. So you only have two fixed points, but the left its number is running off to infinity. All right, so the key to the example is if you do this, and this guy is not differentiable at the North and South Pole. Um, and the surprising thing, you can go back and look at this paper, this is proof is actually quite easy. It's basically just calculus. You show that if you have a smooth fixed point, the index can't go to zero at the smooth fixed point. So if your index is going off to zero, if your Lefschetz number is going off to zero, there have to be periodic points to contribute to it. Okay, so that's good old Lefschetz formula and some results about it. And as I said, it's rather powerful and all you require is the action on homology. So that's good news. And certainly if you're homotopic, you have the same action on homology. So you get the same you know, results. So that's all good for the basic theme of the lectures. But the problem, oops, sorry, the problem as I keep uh, going on about is that it only tells you the total index of the set of fixed points. And this is true for all the iterates as well. All right, so you only get total index and it's not an estimate on the number of periodic points. And it, in fact, it also tells you about fixed points, not about periodic points, where right? periodic points could collapse to be lesser period. There's all sorts of issues. So Nielsen theory, as I said, was developed originally by Nielsen um, in the 30s, I think, uh, for surfaces. And I, I don't forget, I don't, re, uh, I looked it up and now forget, there was some interaction between Lefschetz and Nielsen. At least they knew each other's work. All right, so as I said already, what you do with Nielsen theory is you separate the fixed point set into classes. And these classes can't interact with each other topologically. So in particular, when you homotope the map, they can't bang into each other. And you can't you know, start with four period ones and push it to a single period four because they're somehow topologically separate in a way which I'll tell you. OK, so there's some basic definitions of Nielsen theory. There's always two definitions of Nielsen theory, one in the base using arcs and one in the universal cover. So now, I should have said on the previous slide, the Lefschetz theory is about homology, but Nielsen theory is homotopy. So it's all built on pi one. So another way of thinking about it 
is your homology is very coarse. Pi one is very fine, but as you all know the consequences, it's not so easy to compute in pi one. But Nielsen theory is homotopy, pi one. Okay. So here's the definition. So we have a pair of fixed points and you say they're Nielsen equivalent and it's written like that. So you require a path between them. So the path starts here, it ends it there. You hit the path with the function and you get a new path. And they're said to be Nielsen equivalent if the image of the path and this path can be homotope to each other relative to the fixed points. Remember, this is a fixed point and this is a fixed point. All right, so that's Nielsen equivalent. So there's an arc between them and the image of the arc is homotopic to the original arc. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can the pass, uh, can the, the uh, can this homotopy uh, pass through other fixed points? Uh, fixed points. Yes. Yes. So that it's only it's just homotopy. It, has, it pays no attention to the other fixed points. It's just relative to the two end points. It's not relative to the fixed point set. It's just these two points that matter. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So as an example, it was also an example to show you how hard it is to work with. Let's take um, Z goes to Z cubed on the circle. And on the circle, there's a pair of fixed points under Z goes to Z to the third. There's a pair of fixed points. And if you take any arc between them, if you think about the picture anyway, it's gonna be wrapped three times around or one and a half times around or whatever it is. So they're not gonna be Nielsen equivalent. All right, but again, you can imagine trying to turn this into a proof, you have to look at all possible arcs. All right, so the way around that is to use the other definition, which uses the universal cover. All right, so, and this again, see Nielsen worked on surfaces, so his universal cover was the hyperbolic disk. But then somewhere along the line, the whole theory got generalized. I don't actually know the history. Okay, so universal cover, hopefully everyone knows the universal cover. Um, it's the unique covering space that's simply connected. It's unique up to proper equivalence relation. Some standard examples that are be important here is the plane sits over the torus, sitting over our wedge of two circles. We have the infinite valence four graphs, or the infinite valence four graph. There's various ways to draw this picture, but I prefer this one for reasons that'll be clear later because you get limit points on the circle at infinity. All right, now the important thing about the connection of the universal cover to the fundamental group is the fundamental group acts on the universal cover in a properly discontinuous fashion. In particular, it's fixed point free. And if you mod out by that action, you get back to your original space. All right, now I'm a little sloppy here. The action of a element here is written like this sometimes and written like this sometimes. All right, so universal cover action of pi one. So Nielsen theory is gonna happen in the universal cover. All right, so here are some properties that just to emphasize, I'm, as I said, I'm gonna skip most of the proofs, but the proofs use all of these properties. So because it's fixed point free, if you, if you hit a point by two different deck transformations, they're the same. And this one turns out to be very important that if you move a point by a deck transformation, if you bring it outside, you don't, it doesn't commute. What you get is the deck transformation corresponding to the uh, action of G on that. So a deck transform, so the pi one, so this is the language I'm gonna use. So the deck transformation is the action of pi one on the cover. So they're sometimes called covering transformations or deck transformations. And they're identified with the group of deck transformations is identified with pi one. All right, so that's all the language. All right, so deck I think comes from the German. Um, means light cover, layers, I don't know. I always think of it as in an apartment building, everyone has their own deck. So it's like sitting above a covering space. And this will also be important for a later definition. But if you have homotopy downstairs, it lifts to, and you lift one of them, there's a unique homotopy to the other, which is equivariant. All right, so equivariant homotopies will allow us to, in the covering space, 
compare homotopic maps. All right, so here's the second definition of Nielsen theory, um, that two things are Nielsen equivalent, if and only if there's a lift. So let me draw a picture here, just because it's a little cut off of it. So the whole thing is sitting down here. You have a pair of fixed points, and you lift them. And they're Nielsen equivalent if there's a single duct transformation which lifts them both. All right, so if you can lift everything and make them fixed points in the cover, then they're in the same Nielsen class. All right, so I'm not going to prove this. It's not that hard, but the, the hint here is the cover is simply connected, right? So there's a path here. And because and then the image of this path is something up there. But once again, the cover is simply connected. Here, I have the picture here, so the Zoom people can see it. The, the, the cover is simply connected, so these are homotopic, and then you push the thing downstairs and they're homotopic. All right, that's one way. The other way is equally as easy. So again, this is all in the slides, they're all posted. So I'm trying to skip them all here. All right, and focus more on examples. So what time? So let me, I'm gonna stop for the break shortly. So let me, let me do the examples and then I'll stop for the break. So here are some examples to show you how to work with it and how the covering definition is so much easier. Let's go back to the circle. And um, in the covering space, the action is just multiplication by K. And we look at a particular lift, all right? And we see, so here's the lift we care about, okay? And we say, well, what if we have a what if we have a fixed point upstairs? Well, this anyway, this is a little sloppy. I'm looking at this lift. So all the lifts upstairs look like a shift of this F tilde. So it would mean you'd have a fixed point of this. Sorry, you'd have the, satisfy this equation. So if a lift fixes a point, then you get this equation. You know, if, if you know, x tilde goes to there, that tells you that x tilde is n over k minus one. All right, so the upshot of this thing is because of the expansion, we'll keep coming back to this, and this is the hyperbolicity I was talking about, that each cover, each lift has at most has exactly one fixed point. All right, so you just write down this equation. I muddled this up a little bit, sorry. But you just write down the algebra, and you see that every lift has exactly one fixed point, all right? So this Nielsen equivalent thing can't happen, right? So every fixed point is in a different Nielsen class, all right? Much easier than drawing an arc and kind of fussing around with it. All right, so just from simple algebra, we have a unique fixed point. Sorry, we have every, every fixed point is in a different Nielsen class. All right, let's do the same game with the linear NOSOP. Here, I think I chose, this is not a linear NOSOP. This is, oh yeah, sorry, it is, but sorry, you can't see it. Um, is there any way to deal with this thing? All right, so you can see it there. There's the matrix five, seven, two, two, all right? And then we wanna see what its fixed points look like. All right, so once again, all the lifts look like A, Z plus N. So we, we what, a, what a lift looks like, like looks like some lift and then the deck transformation of it, composition with. We once again, an equation, we get this equation, this A minus the identity we saw already in the index will keep coming back. And then once again, this is invertible because we don't have one as an eigenvalue. And that's because the thing is hyperbolic to start with. All right, so that's all sitting in the background. And so once again, we get every lift as a unique fixed point. All right, since this guy is invertible. So all the fixed points, remember there were six of them, they're all in different Nielsen classes. 
All right, so once again, same deal. Now, we don't have just expansion in the cover, we have hyperbolicity in the cover, but and we have algebra comes to our rescue, but later on, we're gonna get geometric hyperbolicity as opposed to kind of formulas. Um, and here is an example of what, where you have in the same Nielsen class. So here's just a kind of baby example. Once again, we do a saddle node, and then this guy and this guy, well, there's an arc between and the image is that. So they're in the same Nielsen class, right? And this is supposed to show you have the sync saddle, you compress them, do a saddle node and disappear. All right, they're in the same Nielsen class. And so they're like antiparticles and they can disappear. Okay, so this is a uh, great time. So I'll come back next time uh, in 15 minutes and we'll talk about persistence. So just as a preview, if you have a Nielsen class, we can define its index. And if its index is non-zero, it persists under homotopy. So that's the big theorem. So we'll come back, whatever it is, 35. Unless there are questions, I don't mean to cut you off. Questions? All right, go away for 15 minutes. Or not, or continue talking. No one's leaving. What's your preference? Anyone want to take a break or not? You're yeah. still maybe should maybe 10 minutes. Maybe 10 minutes. You can stay here if you want. 10 minutes. Okay. So what we're on about now, as I said, is the fundamental theorem of Nielsen theory, which is that if you have a Nielsen class with non-zero index, it persists under homotopy. Now we have to define the index of a Nielsen class, and that's what this next thing is about. So we saw that here's what an example of nearby points are Nielsen equivalent. So it's a fairly easy argument that if you have a pair of fixed points, if they're close enough, then they're in the same Nielsen class. Right, they're in some little neighborhood. We're in a manifold now, so we're in a simply connected neighborhood. If you're close enough together, you pick an arc, the image of the arc is going to be in a ball, and so it's going to be homotopic. So that's just the argument for the next thing is that nearby, this is just stating that nearby points are Nielsen equivalent. As I said, it's pretty easy to prove. Right, within epsilon, it depends on the map and the manifold. All right, with this in hand, then you prove fairly readily that Nielsen classes are open in the fixed point set, right? Because there's a neighborhood around it where everything in that neighborhood is Nielsen equivalent. And it also implies that Nielsen classes are compact. Remember the fixed point set as a whole is compact and the Nielsen classes are a finite number of pieces. And so because of the compactness, there are finitely many Nielsen classes. All right, so this is the setup you get fairly easily finite number of Nielsen classes, each is compact, and each is relatively open. So what that means is if I take a Nielsen class, it's compact, it's relatively open, so there's an open set around it, which avoids the rest of the fixed point set. So what that implies then is that we can define an index. All right, so we can define the index of an individual Nielsen class. All right, and that's the heart of our main theorem. And so if we looked at, for example, go back to our standard examples, then remember for multiplying the k-fold cover of the circle to itself, every fixed point is in a different Nielsen class. They all have index minus one, so they're all essential. All right, once again, same for the toral automorphism. Each, we have the Nielsen classes now are just single points and they're all essential. Just to have uh, an example where it's not the case, let's take irrational flow on the torus, uh, slow down at a point, and we have a single fixed point. So it's clearly alone in its Nielsen class, but it's non-essential, it has non-zero index for the obvious reason, at least for the theorem coming, is that you can perturb in the homotopy class and disappear it. All right, so this is an example of a Nielsen class that's non-essential. 
All right, now this is just a little comment or intuition before we get to comparing maps. So we're all familiar in dynamics of the suspension flow. So a good intuition for Nielsen classes is that you take the suspension flow, you have a pair of fixed points in the suspension flow, they turn into a pair, a pair of closed curves. So the fixed points are Nielsen equivalent if and only if those closed curves are homotopic. All right, so as I said, it's a good intuition, but it's not so valuable for proving theorems. But you know, if you want to think about Nielsen equivalents in a different way, it's quite a good kind of, if you have a geometric intuition, what it means. Okay, so now the fundamental theory that we're working on is we want to homotope the map. So I need to talk about Nielsen classes corresponding under homotopy. You know, the map at one end has Nielsen classes, the map at the other end has Nielsen classes, and we have to connect them somehow. All right. So once again, there are two equivalent definitions, one taking place with arcs and the other taking place in the universal cover. All right. So first definition is similar to the arc definition. We have a pair of fixed points. We have an arc between them. And now we act not by F, but rather by the homotopy, right? So at each point, you have a different T, and that gives rise to Ft composed of gamma, but F1 at this end fixes it, F0 at this end fixes it. So they're in the same Nielsen class. Now remember, they're Nielsen equivalent. I shouldn't say Nielsen class. They're Nielsen equivalent for homotopic maps. So they tell you a fixed point of one map corresponds to a fixed point of another. All right, now the other definition takes place in the universal cover. So they're Nielsen equivalent if there exists an equivariant homotopy. So remember, I told you that before, if you have a homotopy, you can lift it to a, a homotopy that's equivariant with respect to deck transformations and lifts so that the same story happens. You know, you, you the equivariant homotopy at one end you lift the lift of X zero at the other end, you lift the lift of X one, where at the two ends you're acting by F zero tilde and F one tilde. All right, so the way you prove this is almost the same as the one dimension, as the single map picture, but this is the definition of Nielsen equivalence of corresponding maps and Again, the um, definitions are the same. And this is just a little comment for a kind of language. So I've defined Nielsen equivalence for points, but the comment here is it actually corresponds the entire Nielsen class, right? If these guys are Nielsen equivalent and these guys are Nielsen equivalent. In other words, they're in the same Nielsen classes. Since this is equivalent to this, then the whole thing is transitive. All right, so I can, without contradiction, speak of Nielsen classes corresponding under homotopy. Okay, so the main tool here, I'm not gonna give the proof, but with this main tool, it's just a slick way to think about things. There's something called the fat homotopy. So when you have a homotopy, it's kind of hard to think about because there's these two maps and they're each acting and all that. So this is a clever trick or putting them into a single map. So you, you create the cylinder. So here's the manifold or the space across the cylinder. And at each slice, so each slice corresponds to fixed T here, you act by FT of the homotopy. So capital F acts on this end by F0, acts on this end by F1, and on the T slide acts by FP, which is an intermediate thing in the homotopy. Oh, excuse me. All right, so this geometricizes the whole homotopy thing for you. And you don't have to think about two maps. You can think about a single map. And then the thing that saves you, that makes the whole theory work, is that things are Nielsen equivalent if and only if the corresponding points are Nielsen equivalent under the fat homotopy. All right, so let me point it to here. So here you have a fixed point, all right? And here you have another fixed point. And you know from some definition they're Nielsen equivalent, 
but that's the same as being Nielsen equivalent on this fat map. All right, so it takes the whole Nielsen equivalent thing under homotopy and turns it into a single map and Nielsen equivalents under the single map. All right, so it simplifies all the proofs fairly uh, nicely. Let me skip the, um, the argument. It's not a hard argument. It's basically unravel the definitions. And here's the uh, main theorem here. And let me unravel it a bit for you. So the collection of Nielsen classes is called NCF. Remember, there's finitely many of them. And if you have homotopic maps, now we're talking about, I said we could do this in a well-defined fashion. We talk about the equivalence of the Nielsen classes in the homotopic maps. And the main theorem that I've been plugging here is that if you have an essential Nielsen class, then when you homotope the map, there's an essential class of the end of the homotopy, or the homotopic map that's Nielsen equivalent. And even stronger, it has the same index. All right, so this in particular says is if the index of this is non-zero, in other words, there's a fixed point here, then the index of this is non-zero. All right, so this expresses that fact that I keep saying that if you have an essential Nielsen class, it persists under homotopy in exactly this sense. Okay, so back to our basic examples. We um, have z goes to zn. All the fixed points are in different Nielsen classes. So each Nielsen class is a single point. They're all essential. So you homotop them out, they all persist. All right, same with our toral automorphism. We have six points, fixed, fixed points. Because this guy's hyperbolic, they're all saddles. They all index minus one. They all persist. All right, so here's another example, which will be useful in a minute. But here, it's you geometric well, on the plane you flip. It's z goes to minus z in complex notations, or you're taking the torus and flipping it around that axis. All right, so it turns out there's four fixed points. All right, and they all have index plus one. Here's the computation. Right, so here's here's the matrix. We compute this thing. They all have index plus one. They're all in different Nielsen classes. So that's maybe clear from the picture, but there's ways of checking this using the cover, which we'll come to later. And so in particular, in this case, again, the Lefschetz formula, just to go back to that, is four, gives us four. In front. We have four fixed points. The Lefschetz thing sees them all. They're all essential. All right, so they all persist under homotopy. Okay, so now this is, maybe I think I'm gonna skip this. So there's coordinates for Nielsen classes in pi one, and they're very interesting objects, and it's something I'm working on now. These are old, but I'm doing some new things, but it's a bad idea to talk about work in progress. So let me just say there are coordinates, and next week I'll tell you about the abelian versions of these coordinates which are connected to a theorem of Franks for homotopy um, invariance. All right, so now we've been talking about fixed points, but we also want to understand periodic points, of course. Um, so you, the fixed points persist, but there's this problem, is the fixed point set can contain things of lesser period. All right, so what we really want is that a periodic point persists with the same period, all right? So we all know about period dividing bifurcations. So for example, period doubling, your index is the same for the second iterate, right? The second iterate has the same index here as it has after, after period doubling, but the period has shrunk, or it's like a half bifurcation in reverse, right? You have a circle with rational rotation on it. Periodic points all shrink down under the bifurcation. So we got to take care of this in Nielsen theory. So the way this is dealt with in Nielsen theory, excuse me, is collapsibility. So you say that a point of least period n is collapsible if there is a period periodic point of lesser period, of course it has to divide the period, 
that's Nielsen equivalent to it under the n figure. All right, so you should again think about these guys going around like this, and we have an arc between there and there under the third interval that <laughs> comes back to itself. So that's a signifier that this guy is able to collapse down to the fixed point. Okay, so this is what we want to avoid. All right, so this is what it means to be collapsible. And so the main result then says that essential uncollapsible periodic points persist under homotopy. All right, so this saves the day. Um, if things are uncollapsible, essential, then they persist as periodic points of the same period, which is kind of what we've been looking for all along. All right, so here's the theorem. Um, if you have a least period n, its period, its class is not is essential and uncollapsible. Then, if you homotope, then the new map has a period of least n point that's Nielsen equivalent under the homotopy. All right, so this is the main theorem of Nielsen theory for periodic points. Okay, so this seems good, but of course we have to check that something's uncollapsible. So again, how do you check something's uncollapsible? It seems like you have to look at all possible, huh? but there's a condition that is a sufficient condition for uncollapsibility, which is usually easy to verify in practice, and that's what we're going to keep using. All right, so here's the condition. So we have a period endpoint, right? They're all fixed. We have maybe three fixed points. They're all fixed under the third iterate. So if they're all in different Nielsen classes under the third iterate, then they're uncollapsible. All right. So again, if you if it's period n, you hit it with the nth iterate, you get and you get all the n fixed points. If they're in different Nielsen classes under the nth iterate, then it's uncollapsible. So it's fairly clear this is true because well, anyway, you can just draw the picture. All right, so this is a comment I added last night just because I wanted to make this point because this is what we're going to use over and over again. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, about this lemma, uh, do you really need that all of these endpoints end no, are no. in different no, this, Nielsen? No, or, this, or this is just a sufficient condition? It's a sufficient condition. It's not necessary. And there's weaker versions of this using lesser periods. It's just this is the one I'm going to use. Yeah, you're right. There's there's weaker conditions. This is not necessary and sufficient. Thank you. Okay. And about the previous slide, uh, yeah, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, if um, or, or the previous one, uh, when when if 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 x uh, collapses to y, then is it uh, always possible to find uh, to homotope f to another map that uh, it really collapses. Uh... Yeah, so this I don't know the answer to. So off the top of my head. So there are some funny examples that I'm not remembering well. It's a good question. So let me just say I don't know right now. But just to be safe. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, there's and there's dimensional restrictions and there's orientation preserving restrictions. But it's a good question, but let me just punt on it for now. But thank you. Okay, so I mean, there's this whole general question: is can you all, if you're Nielsen, if you have five Nielsen classes that are non-zero, can you always find a homotopic map with exactly that? So that's a deep question. There's a lot of work on, and I don't know all the results. All right, so this is what we're going to be using using this this necessary, this sufficient condition. All right, so again, this is the game we're going to be playing. I keep saying this. As we've seen in all these examples, we lift the universal cover. There's some kind of hyperbolicity. This hyperbolicity says that every fixed point is in a different Nielsen class. All right, and this is true for all iterates. All right, so all iterates, all the fixed points are in all different Nielsen classes. So they're all uncollapsible. So this expansion or hyperbolicity in the cover gives us that all the Nielsen classes are uncollapsible. If we also know they're essential, then they all persist. All right, so this is what we're going to use over and over again. 
it was true in the circle example, linear Nosovs, it'll turn out to be true for pseudo Nosovs, which I'll talk about next time, and for all our examples. So this is the main tool, is you have a model map, it's hyperbolic in the universal cover, it has um, essential classes, and then you get persistence from Nielsen theory. All right, so that's that's the uh, name of the game here. And here, uh, here, are my, here are my old examples again to illustrate the thing I just said. We have the amphitrite, the amphitrite of our original, sorry, this is the map Z to the M. We take the amphitrite, all the fixed points of all the lifts of all the iterates are in different Nielsen classes, and they're all essential by our condition. They're all uncollapsible. So they all persist with the same period. All right, exact same argument for linear Nosovs. So this works in any dimension, right? I just chose a special example. It works for a Nosovs or expanding, but you have to watch out if there's this one is in the spectrum. Excuse me. Yes. In these examples, the Frank semi-conjugacy is actually a conjugacy. So semi -con the, the Frank semi-conjugacy is yeah. actually invertible. It's a conjugacy. It's very rare. For expanding in the nose of maps. No, no, no. For not for for for, for not no for for expanding, you're right? I mean, so if you're homotopic to this and you're and you're also hyperbolic, then you're okay. But the theory I'm telling you is you're homotopic to this and you can be anything, right? If you have strong conditions on it, you know, as you're saying, there's theorems for expanding maps on the circle of this degree are in fact conjugate. But that's an analytic theory, not a topological theory, right? So in general, you can have a lot of new stuff. Okay. All right, but we'll see Frank's theorem next time. That we you do get a semi conjugacy but we haven't gotten there yet. All right. Yeah, it's a good point. All right. So here's the example I did before. Um, this is rotation around the axis, and we had four essential fixed points. All right. Now everything else is period two. All right, the period twos are all collapsible, right? So that's why I chose this example for the for the second iterate, sorry. For the second iterate, right? It's isotopic to the identity, right? So all these period twos are collapsible, right? So, and in fact, the four fixed points have to persist, but none of the period twos persist because they're all collapsible, right? You take the second iterate, you don't know anything at all except the fixed points. All right, so this just shows some collapsibility example. Okay, so now let me just say something about the suspension flow again, and then look at, so these examples are all abelian, right? And in some sense, as already was made a good comment, there's a theorem of Frank's, and that's next week's lecture all about the abelian theorem and Frank's theorem. Um, but, in the suspension, you might worry about, so we know that, already know that as fixed points, they're homotopic. But if we wanted to use what we said before, we'd have to take the suspension of the second iterate. But in fact, you can get more, you can take suspension of the first iterate, and now a period two orbit is now a closed curve that goes twice around in the S1 direction. And so once again, they're Nielsen equivalent if and only if these guys are homotopic in the suspension. All right, that requires a little more work. But again, it's a good intuition that periodic points are periodic points are, are Nielsen equivalent if they can be homotopic one to the other in the suspension. Okay, so let's go back to our example and see implement this again cover expansion argument. All right, so again, here's our learned about this just an hour ago. Here's the action on pi one. We implement it as a map on the wedge of two circles with the um, Midas as possible. There's the arrow transition state. Now let's look at the true non-abelian theory. 
All right, so the universal cover, as I said, is the valence for a graph, infinite valence for a graph. And I want to picture it. As, so I drew this picture, just as I said, I want to circle at infinity. So if you know um, this from your surface topology, if you take the torus and pull out a point, then the wedge of two circles fits inside of it. And then when you lift it to the universal to the universal cover, which is the Poincare disk, you get this picture. All right, so this is kind of a sloppy picture. It's the punctured torus, and then this is sitting inside of it. So I'm going, to, the universal cover I have to think about for Nielsen theory is this guy. All right, so how do we act? Well, if you know any geometric group theory, you know that this guy, or even, well, probably even your first group theory, this guy is actually the Cayley graph of the free group on two symbols. Right, so we label the vertices by elements of the group, right, in each direction. And now we have to act on this by our map. Well, we know how to act on this by our map because we know the action on pi one, which is the, so there's a standard way to act on a Cayley graph by a group homomorphism. Well, you just, well, this goes to itself, A goes to wherever phi of A goes, B bar goes to wherever B bar. In other words, the vertice goes to where the word goes in the action on pi one. All right, so this says all that stuff, that if we have a vertex and it corresponds to the group element G, then the way we move that point is we move the vertex by the action on the free, on the free group and then look at its vertex. All right, so again, if you know this stuff, this is how you have a group homomorphism act on the Cayley graph. And now we have the gaps, we have the edges here we have to worry about, but on the edges here, it goes to something, but it gets stretched by four. So the derivative is uniformly four. So the edges between vertex, we just do what you have to do and don't do anything stupid, just stretch it as much as possible as much as needed. All right, and now we need a metric on, I'm gonna have a metric on the cover. So I keep plugging hyperbolicity in the cover. So we don't have a linear formula in the cover and I don't wanna use derivatives because I don't really have them. So what you do is you use a metric. So we lift the metric to an equivariant metric in the cover. So each circle will have length one. So we lift that to the cover. And this will be equivariant in the sense we hit it with a deck transformation. And then now, now we come to the, the point is that V1 increases word lengths uniformly by four. All right, so let's go back and look at the formula here. And that's because if you have a word, you write it out, then you substitute this in for every letter in the word. Having done that, there's no cancellations. So this was cooked up as an example. So there would be no cancellations, right? Whenever you iterate, you don't get shorter because there's no, you can just check all the cases, A bar, B bar. This guy is uniformly expanding in pi one by a factor of four, okay? Or, well, anyway. All right, so the crucial observation then is this, that, with respect to this equivariant metric in the cover, when you hit it with the lift of the map, then the distances are multiplied by four, all right? So it, it's expanding by a uniform factor of four in this covering space, this infinite valence four. All right, so it then follows from that an easy argument, which I'll give you, give you here, that all the fixed points of the nth iterator in different Nielsen classes. All right, so once again, um, we just iterate the formula in the standard way. So the nth iterate expands by four to the n. This is strictly expanding, not hyperbolic, strictly expanding. And so if we have a pair of fixed points, then their distance is multiplied by four to the n. So they have to be, depends on how you want to finish the argument, then um, they must be equal if, you know, it must be zero for this. 
Okay, so now let's draw our conclusions. All the periodic points are essential, they're uncollapsible, so they all persist as period endpoints in any map homotopic to phi. So we chose the simplest map in the homotopy class. Now we're going to homotope it as wild as we want, and we don't lose any periodic points. Now, the next question is what about the other dynamics? And that's the rest of the lecture. All right, so I make a little comment here. Let me just ignore that. Let's go next. All right, let's look at our other examples. All right, so back this example, Lefschetz at least told us the index of the nth iterate. But for the other guys, remember, we had no information from Lefschetz at all, right? It acted as zero on homology. Remember, here's the action, all right? But I cooked up this example, so there would also be no cancellation. By no cancellation, I mean, you know, when you hit a word in pi one by the homomorphism, the word, there's never cancellation. The word length always gets multiplied, in this case, by four. Okay, so once again, same game, because of the nice action on pi one, we get expansion in the cover by a uniform factor. Well, I should have censored this, you can ignore this. That all the fixed points are different in different Nielsen classes, they're all essential, they all persist under homotopy. All right, so left shifts tells you that there's one fixed point of all, in all iterates, and Nielsen theory tells you that there are four to the n minus one periodic points, um, and their periods are the same as our model map and are the same as can be computed from the transition matrix. All right, so this was thrown here just to show you Lefschetz tells you virtually nothing. <laughs> Nielsen theory tells you everything. Same thing with this example. This now I cooked up. So again, there's no cancellation. And the action on pi one is the identity. Lefschetz tells you nothing. But again, because we expansion, we expand in the cover by a factor of five now, because each of these has <coughs> word length five. And so once again, all these periodic orbits, which we get from the Markov partition, are different. They're all essential because they're all minus one. And so they're all homotopy stable. That's just another word for they persist under home. Okay, so this was these examples, you know, show you the limitations of left shifts. They also show you concretely how in various cases you prove persistence. But once again, sitting in the background of all these ex examples is some geometric fact about expansion in the universal cover. And remember, the universal cover is essentially the fundamental group. So sitting in the background of all these is some kind of exponential growth on the fundamental group. If you look at these formulas, because there's no cancellation, you know that things are growing like, in this case, five to the n, right? So entropy is log five, if you wanna think in those language, that language. All right, so that's the story of persistence of periodic points. All right, so I have about 10 minutes. Um, now let's look at the rest of the orbits. All right, so this is only, we all know usually the periodic points are accounted in this little measure set. And um, we like to get all the rest of the stuff to persist. Uh, you know, there's all these other invariant measures. There's these minimal sets, um, transitive, I mean, all the other stuff we know about dynamically. And so, the correct notion that, gener that generalizes Nielsen equivalence is something called global shadowing. So it's a definition due to Kentuck, and if I'm gonna follow up a paper of Michael Handel's fairly closely, the idea actually has quite a long history, which I'll maybe talk about next week. But if you know about quasi-geodesics, this is basically, you have a hyperbolic manifold, you have a quasi-geodesic, it says in the universal cover, then the quasi geodesic is a bounded distance away from the true geodesic. This is sometimes called Morse's lemma, it goes back to his thesis in the 20s. So the quasi geodesic shadows the true geodesic. Okay, so this is global shadowing. So we need to once again, in the 
in the tradition of Nielsen theory, we're going to have two definitions for global shattering. So first, we need the arc definition. So I need the definition of the length of an arc. But it's not the length of an arc. It's the length of a homotopy class for all endpoints of an arc. All right, so script L is probably bad notation. Doesn't mean left shits anymore. So it's the smallest distance, it's the smallest or the end of all the lengths of points. I don't know what, what, this, what this alpha is doing here. Oh, it's length of alpha. Anyway, oh, I see gamma is here. So we have our two endpoints, gamma zero and gamma one. Well, if I draw a picture, you just do what you think. I mean, if you have a Riemannian metric, you take the do that thing. The idea of some crazy thing and take the shortest distance. All right, so it's the shortest distance in the homotopy class rel the endpoint, where it could be an infimum. And again, you take it over rectifiable things. You have a Riemannian metric, whatever you want to do it. All right, so now let's define what we mean to be Nielsen equivalent. We're going to have two cases here, invertible maps, non-invertible. Non-invertible, we just go forward time. All right, we say they globally shadow if there's an arc between them and a constant k such that the distance between them with respect to this arc or the length of this arc between them as we iterate stays uniformly bounded. All right, so they bounce around. Let's say we're in a manifold. They bounce around the manifold. And when they bounce around, there's an arc between them that doesn't stretch. It's not, doesn't see, for example, your, it doesn't, it doesn't stretch. It just stays like that. All right, so this is for two different maps. Here we're acting by F0, here we're acting by F1. We can have the same condition for a single map where you have two orbits globally shadow for single map, same thing, but you just have single orbit. All right, so we write it like this, globally shadow. Um, and we have a homeomorphism. We also have to have this true in backwards time. All right, so this is global shadowing downstairs. So again, there's you know, some arc and it doesn't stretch and they, they stay bounded distance away from each other topologically. Now, not surprisingly, you'd want to unravel this and put it in the universal cover. So we need to have a metric. We have an equivariant metric on the universal cover. Think back to the example I have. And you say they globally shadow if there's a constant such that the iterate under one of them and the iterate under the other of the two corresponding points say a stay a uniformly bounded distance away in the cover. All right, so now we think of, you've unwrapped the thing to the covering space, these pair of points bounce along and they stay a bounded distance from each other, right? And you can see the connection of the two, you just put, put an arc between these two, right? And then it bounces along, the universal cover is simply connected. All right, so this is global shadowing. So it's the same, it's like shadowing, but it's now in the covering space. So that's why it's called global shadowing, and the shadowing constants can, are arbitrarily large. It's not like a small perturbation as well. All right, so this is global shadowing. All right, and it's gonna turn out to be the generalization to general orbits of Nielsen equivalents, as we'll see in a bit. All right, so in addition to this hyperbolicity, we're going to need more hypotheses to get persistence under global shadowing. This will give persistence of all the dynamics, but they'll be satisfied by all our examples. Um, phi 1, phi 2, uh, linear Anosovs, pseudo Anosovs, which on surfaces I'll tell you about tomorrow if you don't know about them, was the inspiration for all this. Um, and I'll tell you these hypotheses, but they're stronger. So Nielsen stuff, not surprisingly, preserves periodic points. And now we need more hypotheses to preserve stuff up to global shadowing, or which is to say all the dynamics up to semi conjugacy. All right, so here are the hypotheses that we're going to need. First is the expansion in the cover. All right, so this we've seen already. So it's going to be called pi one hyperbolic. 
if there's an equivariant metric and with respect to that metric, we're expanding by some uniform factor. All right, so this is the expansion version, which we need for non-injective maps. So all our examples satisfy this, lambda was four, lambda was four, lambda five. Um, this is, we haven't really talked about expanding maps on Tori. I've been looking at linear NOSOFs, which are injective, but you can have expanding maps, linear expanding maps on Tori. Um, and what do you do for a homeomorphism? So this is more relevant to tomorrow. So you can't require expansion uniformly. So there's a pair of equivariant pseudometrics and their sum is a metric where you expand in forward time and expand in backwards time, all right, with respect to different metrics. So these, if you think of linear and Ossoff, these are the two directions of the linear and Ossoff. The dis, you know, the eigen directions, the coordinate, the eigen coordinates are pseudo are pseudometrics. All right, so this this case, the pseudo nosos, which we'll talk about tomorrow, which as I said, is kind of where all this stuff was built for. So this is what you have to do for homeomorphism. So this is true hyperbolicity. You have stretching and contraction, but you need to invert the the fun, you need to invert the function so that you can use the inverse and make it, so the inverse is expanding, at least on a subspace. All right, so the obvious comment here, hopefully at this point, that if it's pi one hyperbolic, then you iterate it, then you expand by lambda to the end in the cover. So all of the fixed points are in different Nielsen classes because you cannot have two fixed points under any lift here of any iterate. So they're all in different Nielsen classes, all right? And they're all single points, all right? Now, this is a little comment. I'm a little worried about pi one hyperbolic because it's not clear how to go from pi one hyperbolic to this geometric condition with pseudometrics, et cetera. But it works on surfaces and wedges of surfaces. Okay. All right, so here's the other hypothesis we need, which I said are satisfied. So if you're pi one hyperbolic, you need more conditions. Periodic points are dense and all they're all essential. So the essentialness is not surprising, all right? So pi one hyperbolic gives us all the periodic points in different Nielsen classes. Um, this makes them all essential, but this thing comes in to globalize things properly, as you see when I tell you about the proof. All right, so these now have names H1 and H2. All right, so what do I wanna say here? I've already said this stuff over and over again. They're in different Nielsen classes. They persist because of non-zero index. But first we need a lemma here. This is just show we're honest here, that it in fact is equivalent for a periodic point. So all this is saying is that if you're Nielsen equivalent, then you global in shadow. If you global in shadow and you satisfy one of these hypotheses, in fact, you don't need them all, you just need pi one hyperbolic, then you're a Nielsen equivalent. All right, so this is just saying, again, you have to prove this. This turns out to be fairly tricky to prove. It seems kind of obvious, but you need some stuff using deck transformations. But anyway, so this is just tell, reassuring us that, and in fact, we're gonna use this very strongly in the main proof that Nielsen equivalence can be generalized for general orbits and Nielsen equivalent things are do globally shadow. All right, so here's the theorem I wanted to get to. Um, and this, again, I'm stating, this is basically Handel's theorem that I jazzed up a little with the hypotheses. So let's say you satisfy H1. So remember what this is, expansion in the cover or expansion and contraction in the cover. Everything has non-zero index and periodic points are dense, all right? But again, all our examples satisfy that. Then there's this compact G invariant set Y and a continuous onto map Y onto X, which is homotopic to the inclusion such that this commutes. All right, so the thing to notice here is that Y doesn't have to be all of X, all right? When you homotope in this class, you can create new dynamics. 
I mean, you can create new Nielsen classes, all right? But there's a compact invariant set, which covers, carries all the dynamics of this, all right? So in particular, whatever you're interested in, you have a Gothic invariant measure, and sitting above this, you have a convex set, you take extreme points, and you get invariant measures ergodic up here that correspond um, entropy of because the entropy is bigger. So the, if you're homotopic to this, you have bigger entropy or at least the same amount of entropy. It may not be bigger. Um, so this will be the last thing. And the next time we'll come back to this and, and um, show you a little bit about the proof, how it uses global shadowing. For all our examples on the circle, we already seen they're pyro and hyperbolic. All the classes are essential. We didn't talk about this before, but standard dynamics, periodic points are dense. They all have non-zero index. And so if we homotop one of these maps, any of them, no matter how they act on homology, we homotop any of these maps, then the dynamics persist up to semi-conducive. Right, there's this compact invariant set for the new map, which carries all the dynamics. All right, and as I said here, for pseudo and all self maps, they're pi one hyperbolic, same story. And in fact, this is the origins of this theorem, and it's very powerful in two dimensional dynamics. And let me stop here, and then I'll do it. I'll tell you a little more about this next time, and then put it to use. All right, so we want to develop this theory, and then learn more about dynamics and rotation sets and other things based on it. So that'll be all two days or something. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? Sure, please. Uh, what is the main obstruction uh, generally to extend alpha to a semi-conjugacy? Yeah, so the ex so it's the obstruction is basically more well there's the geometric obstruction is a new nielsen class so let's think about well any, any of these examples so you have this set y all right now you can by homotopy create a new nielsen a new periodic orbit of a new nielsen class by homotopy all right so having done that you get a new nielsen class which can't globally shadow anything of your model map, because if it globally shadowed, it'd be Nielsen equivalent, and it's not Nielsen equivalent, all right? So if you have a new Nielsen class, that's an obstruction to Y being everything. So you can also create any other point that doesn't global shadowing. And there's a theorem, um, there's a theorem that I'll put up here, which I'm gonna skip later, but since you asked me, and people are hungry, but, So oh, this is the other obstruction. Well, this goes the other way, but when Y is strictly smaller, then you actually have strictly more um, entropy. So this goes the other way. This is an obstruction, but if you have a new Nielsen class, then that makes Y smaller and that forces more entropy, all right? So when you make Y, if you're stuff outside Y, you actually have more entropy. Right, and again, this holds for pseudo Nasos and also for this class, but that's, again, I was maybe gonna skip that, but that's coming next time. Yeah, thank you, good question. Anything else? Thank you. Sorry? Will you know if they will be available? My slides? Yeah, so if we go back to the slides, all slides of everything. Oops, where's the keyboard? I'll show you this again. Come on, where's the escape key? Sorry. Yeah, so everything is available. Right, so everything is available here. So all those slides of all the lectures this week, next week, all the details, the proofs, uh, the statements, and some added features are all available here. Yeah, what I mean, 
slides just of today. Yeah, so if slides of just the next. Yeah, so well, these are listed by topic. All right, it's listed by, you know, preliminaries, first example, index. So you just pick. You pick the first ones all the way down to global shadowing, right? So in, they're in chronological order, numbered. So you just get to where I stopped, right? Take the afternoon to the class that I paid. 